My name is Jim Timmons. I serve as a deacon and Sunday school teacher here. And uh, we're going to be studying the book of Hebrews today, chapter 3. I'll give you an introduction in a minute, uh, but first let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this day and the blessings you provide for us each and every day, Lord. We're going through some difficult times worldwide due to this virus, Lord, but you're in charge of this world, Lord. You're with your children each and every day, Lord, and we pray for your protection for each and every one of us, Lord, especially the seniors who are most vulnerable to this virus, Lord, and we pray for our church that you would provide for our church and our missionaries around the world as well, Lord. We're so grateful for your love and your blessings each and every day, Lord. Lord, uh, uh, we're going to be studying in the, the, the book of Hebrews this morning, Lord. We ask, we ask your blessing upon the study that you might speak to us through your word, that we can learn from it and apply it to our lives each and every day, Lord. Thank you once again for the salvation you provided that made us your children through your son, Jesus Christ. We just praise you and thank you in his holy name. Amen. Okay, uh, we're going to begin our chapter, and here's a little uh, review. Uh, the book of Hebrews was addressed primarily to the Jewish converts to Christianity, that, uh, and this is in the early church, and uh, at that time, uh, Nero, who you re remember from stories about him fiddling while Rome burned, well, he blamed the burning of Rome which uh, many say that he had actually started the fires, he blamed it on Christians. And Christians were being persecuted in, in many horrible ways. And, uh, and because of this, the, the Jewish converts to Christianity uh, thought it better that they slip back into Judaism, go to the synagogue instead of a house church. And uh, the, the writer of this is, is, is telling them, to persevere, to, to stay with the Lord. Because just like we're going through difficult times today, the Lord was there with them to see them through it, no matter what. And in chapter one, when we looked at it, uh, he was talking about the superiority of Jesus and just who Jesus is. And uh, the Jews had uh, great respect for their prophets. And uh, the prophets, in fact, told Jesus is coming. And Jesus is definitely superior to the prophets. And then in chapter 2, we, we've seen that Jesus was uh, superior to the angels. And uh, the angels are God's messengers, but Jesus is God's son. And so definitely superior. Now today, we're going to look at Moses. Moses was held in very high respect by the Jews. And uh, he was the giver of the law. He's the one that took him out of exile from, from Egypt. And uh, so... Uh, Jesus, of course, is superior to that. In fact, Jesus is the centerpiece of everything we believe. In the previous chapter, we've seen the superiority of Christ over the prophets and in, uh, of the Old Testament, and we've shown that the superiority over the angels. Now, we're going to see that Christ is superior to Moses. And this is because Moses is very important to the Hebrews and held in very high regard. Jesus Christ, of course, is superior to Moses, and the writer of this letter is letting the Hebrews know uh, this, and is going to show it to them by giving an example. Uh, beginning in chapter 3 of Hebrews, we'll look at verse 1, and the writer says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And so the readers are addressed as holy uh, and holy brothers who share in the heavenly call. They were brothers only, not only with one another, but they were brothers with Christ as well. They were holy because Jesus had made them so. And they were partakers of the heavenly calling because God was bringing them to glory. Sanctification, that's called, and, and to grow and, and love and acknowledgement of Jesus Christ. The writer calls the readers to focus their thinking on the one who is both their apostle and high priest. Now an apostle is one who is sent, and Jesus was sent by God to this earth. 
And they were to consider the apostle because he was sent from God into this world and he is the revelation of God. He is our own high priest. A high priest, of course, represents man uh, before God. And Jesus what is our high priest as he intercedes on our behalf and on behalf of all believers. And he is seated on the right hand of the Father uh, this very day. He's interceding on our behalf. Let's look at uh, verse 2 now. Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful to his house. Jesus was faithful to him that appointed him. He was faithful because he came down to earth to represent God to man. He is faithful because he represents us to God when he intercedes on our behalf. Also, Moses was faithful to all in his house. Whose house is this? Whose house is he talking about? The word house is found seven times in the next few verses. So it's important to know whose house he's talking about. It's God's house. Moses was faithful to in God's house. He did what God called him to do and was found faithful in doing so. God's house in the Old Testament, that would be the tabernacle itself. And the tabernacle was what Moses had instructed with in strict obedience to the divine directions given by God the Father. Jesus, as builder, surpasses Moses in honor since Moses was simply a servant carrying out instructions. Look at verses uh, 3 through 6, and we'll go over them verse by verse. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, speaking of Jesus here, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. So looking at verse 3, as I said, Jesus is a, is a builder which surpasses Moses in honor since Moses was simply a servant carrying out instructions while Jesus was himself the builder of the house. As a builder uh, surpasses Moses, Jesus as a builder surpasses Moses the servant in honor. Looking at verse 4, every house was built by someone. You can't have a house without a builder. But he that built all things is God. The Lord Jesus is God. He is the creator. Moses could never make that claim for himself. And then in looking at verse 5, Moses was a servant of God. Jesus Christ is the son of God. There's quite a difference between the son in the house and the servant in the house. So Jesus Christ is superior to Moses on two counts there. Christ is the creator, he was present at creation, and he is the son of God. This is important to see this, and important for them Jews back then that wanted to leave the Christian uh, faith and, and go back to Judaism. And then in verse 6, uh, it says uh, that here, uh, in verse 6, the author explains the composition of the house, which is the people of God. In the Old Testament times, it was the people of Israel, but Israel had rejected the Son of God when he came, and now the people of God is the church, and Jesus Christ is in charge of the church, his church. But we believers are told by the writer that they, as well as all believers, are part of God's house. They are to be courageous in the face of persecution and remain confident that their hope is in Christ and Christ alone. Now verse 7, wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear his voice. The writer is about to give a quote from the Old Testament Psalm 95, and he reminds the reader to listen to what the Holy Spirit says. As we know, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God through the Holy Spirit. And this psalm gives a warning not to harden their hearts when faced with adversity, for God is there always. Now, looking at uh, Psalm 95, which is quoted in verses 8 through 11, 
Uh, we'll go through them and then uh, go through the verses. Uh, begin with verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 3. Pardon not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my work for uh, 40 years, wherefore I was grieved at that generation that they do that they do always err in their hearts as they have not shown my ways. And then in verse 10, I mean in, in, in verse 11, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter, enter into my wrath. So there in Psalm, the Psalm begins with a warning that they were not to harden their hearts and probably uh, in the day, as in the day of provocation, as in the day of testing that is in the wilderness. The Psalm recalls a time when the Israelites did indeed harden their hearts when they were tested in the wilderness. Instead of trusting God to supply their needs, they constantly complained to Moses uh, at any hardship they experienced. After multiple complaints, God had had enough and said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my way. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. You see their grum grumblings and murmurings uh, were patiently endured by God over a span of 20 years. On occasion, God sought to make them aware uh, of their ingratitude and rebellion by sending much deserved punishment upon them in the form of a fire, of plagues, of quails, and poisonous snakes. But all, uh, through it all, he was always offering repentance and, uh, and recovery. And, but from the time they left Egypt, their hearts gradually hardened until at Kadesh Berea, when God uh, uh, commanded them to enter the land of Cana and take it for their own, they rebelled and refused to go. Finally, God spoke in anger and said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my way. So I declared an oath in my anger, and they shall never enter my room. Let's go over these verses uh, one by one. In verse 8, it says to harden the heart. And to harden the heart is to disobey the voice of God and act in accordance with one's own desire. And that's sort of Israel did in the wilderness. Now in verse 9, in their 40 years of wandering, God had provided for their for their needs, uh, for the needs of the Israelites. Since God had done so much for them, they should have trusted him when any difficulties arose. Instead, they complained and murmured among themselves when they should have called upon the Lord, trusting him to provide. But they did not do this, and this angered God. Verse 10, the Bible is clear that God does not look the other way with regard to sin. His reaction to the sins of the Israelites in the wilderness was with anger and wrath. They were indifferent to the ways of God, never taking the trouble to learn them, and got, uh, got them into, this got them into serious trouble. Verse 11, their sin caused God to make an oath that this generation would not enter the promised land, which is called God's rest. Rest describes an end to their wandering and restlessness and a promise of calmness and tranquility. The land of Cana held the promise of a settled life with peace and abundance of God's blessing, but they missed out on this generation because they did not trust God. Now, in verse 12, if unbelief kept the Israelites out of the promised land, how much more serious is it today? To give way to unbelief and then to miss out on the rewards of heaven. What the writer is saying to the Hebrews is that a relapse from Christianity back into Judaism would be comparable to the action that the Israelites took when they, uh, they turned back their hearts to Egypt and they, uh, departed from the living God. The Greek word used here in verse 12, let me read that. Take heed, brethren, lest the any of you uh, an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living, uh, living God. So uh, departing from the living God, the Greek word used in that, that verse there, uh, the English word goes to the uh, 
Jewish word apostasy. Israel departed from the living God by refusing God's will for their life, stubbornly wanting to go their own way back to Egypt. And God did not permit them to turn to Egypt. Instead, he disciplined them in the wilderness. God would not allow his people to return into bondage again. Verse 13 now. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And uh, so they were to encourage one another constantly and uh, urgently, uh, especially during this time of uh, persecution in the world. The Christian fellowship was very important during these difficult times that we're facing. And it is in today. We're facing difficult times today. So fellowship is what helps people build up in the faith and keeps them out away from sin and apostasy. And that's what the, the Lord commanded them to do. And uh, whether they did it or not, uh, we'll see. Uh, in, in verse 14, it says, For we were made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Partakers of Christ means we are in Christ. He belongs to us. If we hold to the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end. What this is saying is if we are faithful to the end and trusting God, just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. There is a peace or rest, as the, as the writer calls in, and it in faithfully trusting Christ, not only for salvation, but for each and every day of our, our lives. Uh, my favorite uh, life verse here is Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. Now, verse 15, of Hebrews chapter 3. And this is a repeat of the quotation from Psalm uh, 95, uh, verse 7. And it's repeated to remind the reader that these truths are not for yesterday only, but for us today, each and every day. The reminder is that today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Now, moving on to verse 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, albeit not all came out of Egypt by Moses. Partakers of Christ uh, means we are in Christ. And uh, it was those uh, who rebelled against God, even though they heard his voice. And it was the people who Moses led out of Egypt that did, were guilty of this. And God was grieved with Israel during the entire 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. Not long after leaving Egypt, they began to complain and provoke God. After he supplied them with bread, when they complained about the lack of food, and then they complained about the lack of water, which he also provided for them. And then, with both bread and water, they complained about the lack of meat. And God even provided that. But complaints never cease. Imagine the, the wonderful miracle that God performed to provide meat for over a million, uh, two million people. Uh, that even in by today's standard, that would be almost an impossibility. But God, our God, is the God of impossibility, and he, there's nothing impossible. And uh, sure enough, he had a. Huge, uh, huge flocks of uh, geese uh, flying over that uh, got caught in a, in a sandstorm or something that wound up uh, uh, falling out of the sky and just raining meat upon the Israelites. Right? So they all had enough to, to have their fill. So it was coming out their ears, so to speak. And then uh, kind of moving on to verse 17. Verse 17. And uh, verse 17 reads, But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And who was it that made our God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned? 
and whose corpses lay in the wilderness, that whole generation perished. That whole generation perished, and uh, they no longer uh, were able to enter into God's rest, the promised land of Canaan. And do you know what their uh, what there was their sin that so grieved God? You know what it was? It was unbelief. They doubted God. And in doubting God's word, that's a serious, serious sin. What's worse it is it leads others to other sins. As for the Israelites in the wilderness, it led to worshiping a golden calf. And it led to fornication and a denial and, and a rejection of God as they turned their backs on him, even so much as wanting to go back into Egypt. Can you believe it? They decided that slavery in Egypt was better than walking by faith into the promised land. They had sinned against God, and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. There was only two men and that entire generation that, that had faith to believe God and, to, and uh, want to enter the promised land. That was Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two men who made it into the promised land of that generation. And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath in verse 18? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but, but them that believe not? And who was God speaking to when he took that oath? That they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it to the very people that disobeyed him? It was because of their unbelief that they would know nothing about walking in the promised land and enjoying its fruits and finding the satisfaction of simply trusting God. Then in verse 19, the final verse of this chapter, it says, So we see that they could not enter, not enter because of unbelief. For it was unbelief that uh, robbed them of entering the promised, promised land. The emphasis in Hebrews is that true believers have an eternal salvation because they trust a living Savior who constantly intercedes for them. That's true today as it was back then. Uh, the writer is careful to point out that this confidence is no excuse for sin. God does discipline his children. The promised land of Canaan is not a picture of heaven, but rather a picture of the believer's present spiritual inheritance in Jesus Christ and him alone. Believers who doubt God's word and rebel against him, if they're believers, they do not miss out on heaven, but they certainly do miss out on the blessings of their inheritance, and today and in the hereafter. So they, and they also must suffer the chastening of God. So there, here is our, our study for today, chapter 3, and we'll be picking up in chapter 4 next week. Uh, but it's certainly a lesson not only to the Jewish Christians that were looking to uh, go back into Judaism in the face of adversity, but to us today to remain steadfast in the, in the faith despite adversity. Adversity should draw us closer uh, to the one who saves and the one who provides for us and the one who loves us. So let's look to the Lord now as we close in the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just rejoice in the teachings of your word. It's certainly an encouragement to us today as it was to the Hebrew Christians back uh, 2,000 years ago. And, uh, and Lord, uh, uh, we're going through troubled times as well with this uh, virus. But we have faith that you're there to see us through it. And we're trusting in you for this and, and for the needs of our church. Lord. We thank you for the blessings that you provide for us each and every day, and the comfort we have in knowing that you're in charge of this world, and nothing can happen unless you let it do it. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you next.